Welcome, everybody. I'm Will Iserman, and I am the director of the Early Childhood Hearing Outreach Initiative, also known as the ECHO Initiative at Utah State University. The ECHO Initiative is housed within the National Center for Hearing Assessment and Management, known as NCHAM at Utah State, of which I am uh, the associate director. NCHAM currently serves as the Early Hearing Detection and Intervention National Technical Resource Center, funded through a cooperative agreement with the Maternal and Child Health Bureau. Um, but for oh, more than 20 years, since 2001, the ECHO Initiative served as a national resource center on early hearing detection and intervention with a focus on supporting early Head Start and Head Start program staff in implementing evidence-based hearing screening and follow-up practices. And we're delighted today to continue to make our resources and other learning opportunities like this one available to staff from Head Start programs, as well as to anyone in early care and education settings who can put the this information um, together. Now, before I go any further, I just want to make sure you all know that this is being recorded. So if anything distracts you from full attention today, or if you think of people who would benefit from the conversation that we're going to have, know that this will be posted on kidshearing.org in the next couple of days. So you can access and stream it and scroll through it at, at any um, speed that you'd like. Um, I want to give a shout out to our interpreters and our captioner today. Thank you for helping make this um, as accessible as possible. We always appreciate your amazing talents and abilities to help us um, do that. Now, we're going to, we received hundreds of questions from you when you registered. And we've tried to incorporate answers to your questions into our presentation today. We did, we tried our best. Um, so let's see how we do. And then we'll open up the question for questions. And if there are remaining questions that we didn't address, we'll open up a Q&A box um, for you to type in your question and we'll, we'll, um, address them that way. So we hope that goes. My my um, co-presenter today is Dr. Terry Faust, who is a pediatric audiologist and a speech language pathologist who has served as a consultant to the ECHO Initiative since our very beginning. So Terry, thank you and, and welcome. Your mic is off, Terry. Thank you, and I apologize for that, and uh, I appreciate that introduction, William. Um, as William said, he and I, along with many other um, ECHO team staff, as well as local collaborators, um, have provided training in nearly every state um, with thousands of staff from Early Head Start, Head Start, um, American Indian, Alaskan Native, and Migrant Head Start, and other early care and education programs over the years, so it's been a lot of programs. And we're always encouraged, just like we are today, with the uh, the huge amount of interest that there is in establishing and maintaining um, evidence-based hearing screening programs, really so that children with hearing-related needs can be identified and served. So our webinar today is primarily intended for those of you who have already had some experience implementing evidence-based hearing screening practices for children in the birth to three age range, in the three to five age range, or both. And, you know, we're just delighted to see that we've had over 1,500 people register for today. Um, now, um, I, I want to make sure you know that we're we're going to do our best to address some of the questions that you address you sent to us. But be aware that if you are really new to early childhood hearing screening, you're welcome to stay on. You can benefit from what we're talking about. But next week, um, we have another webinar, which is an introduction to evidence-based hearing screening. So you can find that on kidshearing.org to register for that if you haven't already seen that. And if you're really needing information that's 
basic, starting from the beginning, that's the webinar that you'll want to attend for sure. And if you know of others that may benefit from that uh, webinar, send them there as well. Um, so we're going to organize our time today around, as I said, many of the questions that you submitted. And we're going to present some of the information about these topics. And we're going to start with a brief overview for everybody and for those who are newcomers to evidence-based practices. Some of you have asked questions about being able to provide a basic rationale to parents or other colleagues on the purpose of hearing screening and what the recommended methods are. So we're going to we're going to talk about that uh that big picture. We're we're then going to turn our attention to a review of issues pertaining to pure tone audiometry, which is the method that's recommended for 3 to 5 year olds. Um since many of you are are getting ready for um, a new round of screenings in the spring. We'll go over the key steps you want to complete to prepare this. And that's also in response to questions that we got that, you know, can we just review this, this procedure? Um, we'll then review the steps um, of the procedure and some of the questions that were raised about pure tone screening. Um, after we address those questions, um, we'll then move on to uh, a similar conversation around otoacoustic emissions or OAE screening, um, which is the method used um, with birth to three-year-olds and increasingly with three to five-year-olds as well. Um, so we'll be talking about, about that. And um, then we'll talk about the, the screening and follow-up protocol and parent support and how to make sure that the steps that need to be followed after a child is screened, particularly when they don't pass on one or both ears, has to get um, uh, implemented and some of the challenges that, that go along with that. And then we'll wrap up by talking about some of our technical assistance resources that are available so that you know what exists and where to find them on our, on our website. And, you know, one of the things I want to say right off the bat is we're always, you know, we're in an interesting dilemma when we try to develop training resources and learning opportunities like this to explain things as clearly and as succinctly as we can. And sometimes I think we inadvertently leave people with the impression that this is easy. And then those of you who have some challenges feel like something's wrong with you when actually it's really a skill development experience that everybody has and that it can become easy and it can be easy with certain children, but all of us run into experiences where we're challenged and where we have difficult completing the screening process. And that's true with pure tone audiometry and with OAEs as well. And so we'll give our best shot at giving you suggestions, but we can't fix every single challenge you run into. Um, we're going to do our best. So let's start off by just talking about the rationale so that you have a good way of being able to set the context for your own screenings. And we always like to start with this graphic to remind people that the work of the ECHO initiative is based on the recognition that each day, young children who are deaf or hard of hearing are already being served in early childhood health and education settings often without their hearing-related needs being known. Hearing loss is often referred to as an invisible condition. So how can we reliably identify which children have normal hearing and which may not? Well, William and, and everybody, really the short answer to that question is that um, early care and education providers we all can be trained to conduct evidence-based hearing screening, just like you see in these photos here. And again, the ultimate outcome of a hearing screening program is that we can identify children who are deaf or hard of hearing who have not been previously 
um, identified. So the procedure on the left on your screen, that's called otoacoustic emissions or OAE hearing screening. And like William said, that's the recommended method for children birth to three years of age. And it's increasingly being recommended for children three to five. Now over here on the right, um, you'll see the procedure pure tone audiometry hearing screening. And that's historically been the most commonly used screening method um, for children three to five years of age and older. And you'll still see that in many early care and education settings and see those providers using it. And so we're going to talk about both of those methods today. Yeah, and before we jump in, Terry, I want to have you answer a question. And Terry, it's fine if you want to keep your, your video off now. But one of the questions that we've gotten repeatedly in the context of those of you who are facing some challenges, particularly with children that might have um, other special needs, disabilities, or um, even uh, language differences. Other than these two methods, are there any recommended methods that we could use for those instances? And um, Terry, let's just address that question right off the bat. Yeah, you know, there there, there really aren't because um, we don't, since we have the ability to do this um, physiologic type screening or objective screening, we don't want to rely on subjective methods. So maybe some of those things that might come to mind are some of those things like ringing bells and, and um, you know, observing reaction to sound. But um, it, we, we have the ability to do so much better. So really it is OAE and pure tone screening. Um, and uh, those should be the methods that should be used. And when you're stuck, when you actually can't get a screening, whether it's one or the other um, methods, um, there are a couple of things you can do. One is if you're using pure tone, you can try OAEs. You can't do it in reverse, though. If you're using OAEs on younger children, birth to three, pure tone is not a backup method for you. So that's one thing to keep in mind. And the other is, you know, you can try having other staff. Um, you can try again at another day. And if mm -hmm. you still are struggling, then you make a referral to a healthcare or to a, an audiologist who will be more skillful in being able to complete the, the screening. The important thing to remember is that children who have a hearing loss may be the very ones who are the most difficult to screen. So we don't want to just write off they were difficult to screen and set them aside for another indefinite time. Um, we want to make sure that those children get on the top of the list for follow-up. Okay. So uh, some of you have asked whether or not you need to be certified to do screenings. Um, and that tends to be a very state-specific issue. We don't know right now of any states that require that, but there are some state guidelines that can influence your practices. So we would encourage you to check that out on a state-by-state -state basis. And the best way to do that is to contact your state's early hearing detection and intervention coordinator, the person responsible for your state's newborn screening program. And you can find that link on our website when you look for information on finding an audiologist. It'll take you to the link for your state's EDI coordinator, the Early Hearing Detection and Intervention Coordinator. So in helping families to really feel motivated to follow up, that's another one of your questions. When children don't pass, we need some, some information that will help them feel the importance of this. And one way is to share information about the incidence of hearing loss and the fact that hearing loss, um, a child's hearing ability can change at any time often without us ever recognizing it. About three children in a thousand are born with hearing loss, being deaf or hard of hearing. Most newborns in the US are now being screened for hearing loss using evidence-based methods before even leaving the hospital. 
But screening at the newborn period isn't really enough because the research suggests, and this is the important point that you would want to convey to parents, that research suggests that the incidence of permanent hearing loss doubles between birth and school age from that original three in a thousand at birth to another three in a thousand, totaling six in a thousand by the time children enter school. And so we want to stay on top of that. And so when children don't pass a screening, they may have a mild hearing loss. They might have a more significant hearing loss, and we might not be able to observe it. Um, and so these screenings are the way to get to that. Now, um, hearing loss can, you know, we don't only screen for hearing at birth, as, as William mentioned, we need to screen throughout early childhood. Because as he said, hearing loss can occur at any time. And it can occur as the result of illness or um, physical trauma or environmental or genetic factors. And so when this happens, it's often referred to as late onset hearing loss. And that just simply means that it occurred after the newborn period. You know, and again, it, it's similar to the subtle changes that you might see in vision that can occur for any of us. A child can experience a change in hearing ability that we want to identify so that they have full access to language and all of the information that um, that they're being exposed to as they, they learn and grow. William, I'm going to have to ask you to take this one for a moment. I'm having a little trouble, technical yeah. trouble on my end. Sure. So, you know, screening is the first step in the process of identifying a disability like a hearing loss. So it's, it's important to know, no screening method is 100% effective in identifying possible areas of concern. Um, parent and caregiver concerns always override a passing screening result, no matter what screening method is used. So, you know, any conversation we have about follow-up um, and screening should always begin with a reminder that screening methods aren't perfect and that whenever a parent or caregiver expresses a concern about language or hearing, children should be referred for a more thorough evaluation, even if the child passed the screening. And that's true even with these highly reliable hearing screening methods that we're talking about um, today. We also want to acknowledge right up front that for any number of reasons, there will be an occasional child that you just can't manage to screen, as we've already alluded to. And after you've tried everything you can do and you have a colleague try it, if that's possible, you'll be faced with that dilemma of what to do. And our recommendation about that is that you make a referral to a pediatric audiologist. And keep in mind, some children you may um, have difficulty screening, like I said, may be the very ones who have a hearing loss. So we don't want to just skip those children just because they were hard to screen. So we just mentioned having a pediatric audiologist in the picture. Now, a pediatric audiologist if you don't know, is a professional who specializes in the diagnosis and non-medical treatment of hearing-related and other disorders associated with the ear and the auditory system. A pediatric audiologist specializes in children. So having access to a local pediatric audiologist can really be helpful. And we recommend that all programs consult with a local audiologist to help develop and oversee your hearing screening and follow-up activities. And to be able to take questions like you have sent to us um, not that we mind it, but it would be nice to have somebody local that you can dialogue with about these challenges. They can help with equipment questions you might have. They can consult with you about specific, specific children who aren't passing. Um, and importantly, they can be one of your resources when you need to refer a child for further evaluation. Um, on our website, kidshearing.org, you'll find a link to find an audiologist. Um, 
which should help you do just that. Terry, are you still connected? I am, you I am, I am back. So thank you. And, and okay. my apologies. No, I did want to mention here, William, that, um, and, and to um, all of us that are here, that some of you submitted some very um, specific equipment, specific questions about the error messages on your equipment. And uh, we would love to address those, but it'd be really difficult for us in a group setting since there are so many different pieces of equipment probably represented um, by you here today. Um, so you, you could pose those questions to the person who sold you the equipment and they can um, let you know what those specific error messages um, are related to. Um, while the equipment distributors and salespeople aren't, the, aren't really the folks you should look to for comprehensive training for a program and those screening skills, they, they do have equipment expertise for those particular models. And so they can absolutely help you understand your equipment functions and the error messages and uh, things like that. We'll address, though, some of the commonality um, as we go further today. But having access to both, um, as William mentioned, a pediatric audiologist and your sales rep can really be helpful for different reasons. And so we really encourage you to have their contact information ready for when you need it. And sometimes, of course, that equipment manual is um, really helpful as well. Yeah, Terry, and you know, one of the questions that a number of you asked was related to screening children with tubes, PE tubes. And, you know, do we screen these children? Uh, do I need to do something to the equipment? And so we can just get this question addressed right up front, right here. So yeah. Terry, yeah. as our, and by the way, if you came on late, this is Terry Faust, who's a pediatric audiologist and a speech language pathologist who's worked with us from the very beginning of our work with the ECHO Initiative. Yeah, thank you for that question, William. Um, yeah, let's address that right now. So yes, absolutely, yes. You can, you can and should screen children who you know have PE tubes. It's really one way to find out if the tubes are actually doing the job they've been put in to do. Um, children with PE tubes, they should pass the hearing screening if those tubes are open and working and the rest of their auditory system is functioning normally. So for those of you using the OAE method, you'll wanna look at your equipment manual because there are a couple pieces that need you to um, push a extra, there's an extra button push to adjust the setting for screening an ear that has PE tubes. So just be sure to check that out for your particular piece of equipment. Um, like I said, some equipment will require a temporary adjustment and other brands do not. But yes, you can and should screen children with PE tubes. Okay, so we have two screening methods we wanna talk about today. By way of big picture, if you're responsible for children who are under three years of age, the recommended method is OAE screening, which you see on the left here. And if you're responsible for screening children three years of age or older, historically, pure tone audiometry has been considered the recommended method for this age group. Um, this is that headset screening where the child raises a hand or performs another task each time they hear a sound that's presented into the ear. And you see this method on the right there. Now, um, several of you asked about why some programs are no longer using pure tone audiometry with the three to five population um, and switching to OAEs. And it's really because there's some growing recognition that although the pure tone method, um, it's been the most widely used method historically, it may not always be the most feasible method to use with some of these younger children. So the research has shown that about 20 to 25% of children in that three to five age group can't be screened with pure tone audiometry or this methodology because they just aren't developmentally able to follow the directions reliably. And that's really been our experience as well. So in those instances, then OAE screening is the preferred method um, for those children. Um, as William emphasized a moment ago, we want to screen every child, even the ones that we find challenging to screen, right? So at a minimum, if you're establishing evidence-based practices for three to five-year-olds, and if you're considering using or you're using pure tone screening, you'll also need to be equipped and prepared to do OAEs 
on that 20 to 25 percent who can't be screened with pure tones. Or alternatively, you'll need to have a means for systematically referring all of those children to audiologists who can perform the screening, which as a cautionary note, frankly, could be pretty challenging in its own right if we're having to refer 20% of the children to an audiologist for a screening. That might not really, really work because audiologists are stretched. Yeah, I think um, exactly. And to simplify things um, a bit here, I, I would say more and more of us audiologists are recommending the use of OAEs uniformly with children three years of age and older um, for several reasons. It's quicker than pure tone screening, both to learn um, to do and to actually implement. And it's far more likely to be a method that will work across the board with children in that three to five age group that you'd be screening. And it's equally as effective. If you need some further guidance on the issues of choosing pure tone versus OAEs for this older population, we have a document on our website on kidshearing.org that addresses just that question. So go there and look for that, that uh, document. And maybe you need to, to hash that out with your health services advisory committee or whomever is uh, involved. So Terry, let's jump into pure tone screening and get into a little more depth here. Okay, so yeah, let, let's let's go ahead. So to conduct a pure tone screening, we're first gonna take a look at the ear. We wanna make sure that there's no visible sign of infection or blockage. Now, by the way, you'll always wanna do this first regardless of what screening method you're going to use. But after you do that, if the ear appears normal, then you as the screener are going to instruct or what we call condition. We're going to condition or instruct the child how to listen for a tone and then to respond by raising a hand or placing a toy in a bucket, for example. Now, once you've observed that the child re um, reliably responds to sounds that are presented just as you instructed, then we start the actual screening. So during the screening process, this listen and respond game is repeated at least twice at three different pitches on each ear. And then you'll be noting the child's response or their lack of response after each tone or pitch is presented. If the child responds appropriately and consistently to that range of tones presented each ear, then the child passes the screening. All right, Terry, let me just put a pin in it for a second. <laughs> We've got several questions that came in um, with the registrations um, and about how to make this conditioning process easier. And, you know, what do you do? How do you, how do you make sure that children really get it? And especially, and, you know, maybe this is a separate question, if there's a language difference between you and the child that you're screening. Yeah, and this is one of the, the things that can, um, it always adds some variability in um, to, the, to the screening, which, um, you know, you wanna really be sure that it's gonna be reliable. But what, what you, you can do is you not only model it, but for example, if I'm training, if you can see in this picture here, you can see that I've got this child's hand in my hand and I'm going to demonstrate and actually when I present the tone, I'm gonna to raise her hand for her or I'm gonna help her drop the uh, toy into the bucket. Um, and so I'm not only verbally instructing, but I am physically modeling and helping her to understand the task. But then I'm gonna do checks to make sure that, that uh, our response is reliable before I would ever um, officially do the screening and uh, try to get those results that we want to get. And if you want to see videos of that played out in longer format, um, the training that's available on, on um, here to screen.org um, is here to screen.org is where you can find a complete um, training uh, session on pure tone screening that, that walks through that. But you know, those are the children, the ones that you're not sure are conditioned. Those 
are some of that 20% that really, you have to find another way. Um, you don't want to just hope that they got it. You want to feel really confident that they're following you. One or two of you actually sent a message saying that you had found that children who had who you were a little unsure about and had passed the pure tone, but when you did OAEs, they did not pass. That's the thing we're worried about. We're worried about somehow subjectively passing a child who really shouldn't be passed because we're we're being generous. We're giving them the benefit of the doubt. We shouldn't ever be giving benefit of the doubt. We we want children to more likely refer than just pass because we're guessing. Okay, so um, the the idea here to always remember, as much as we are champions of children, we don't we don't have an investment in them passing screenings. We want to get accurate results. Yeah, thank thank you, William. And maybe just to summarize on the teaching part, we we instruct, we show, we do it with them, and we try to make it um, fun. So um, let's let, let's go ahead and then move on. So um, so you've we... conditioned the child. You've gotten to the point where you feel like okay, they really understand the game you've set up with raising their hand or dropping a toy. And now this is the screening process. Yeah. So now, now that we feel that they're reliable, during the screening process, this listen and respond game is repeated at least twice at three different pitches on each ear. And then you're going to note the child's response or their lack of response after each tone is presented. Now, if you take a look here, um, if the child responds appropriately and consistently to the range of tones presented, then the child passes the screening. So you can see these checks here at these different pitches. Okay, um, and then what we'd like to do um, is just remind you of some of the things you're gonna want to be sure to address as you get ready to start screening a group of children. So to begin with, and this goes for everyone, regardless of which method you're using, um, be sure to refresh yourself on the resources that we have at kidshearing.org. Yeah, and this is the landing page of kidshearing.org where you're, well, <laughs> where you're gonna find a, a range of resources. Um, and, um, and this is good to go through if you need to equate new staff or refresh yourself. So let's just quickly look at this page and you'll see here, there's planning resources. That right there is where you'll find an audiologist. Um, under the big picture resources is where you would find that document um, comparing OAE and Pure Tone that I mentioned a moment ago. There's screening equipment resources there. Then there's where to access training. Some of you have asked us, where can we go to get standardized, reliable training so that all of our staff are going through exactly the same training? Um, and that's, you can access those links there. Um, and those, those particular training resources there are um, virtual. So they will allow you to um, do the training whenever you need the training. Uh, so it's adaptable to time schedules. The, the next um, set of resources is all about preparing for screening, the protocol guides and forms, which we're going to go over, and documents for how to document your results and, um, and share those results with healthcare providers and audiologists. And then lastly, there's resources for tracking a group of children and monitoring program quality. So if you haven't um, taking a dive into the resources that are available here, we encourage you to do that because as we went through, you know, some of your questions, we realized, oh, if if some of these folks had been on our website, they would find the answers to what they were looking for here in terms of resources that were needed. Um, so, and the other thing I want to point out here at the very bottom, that last arrow under monitoring program quality, 
you'll see those two checklists, OAE Screening Skills Checklist and Pure Tone Screening Skills Checklist. Those are really good resources for refreshing and evaluating yourself and others on making sure that you're doing all of the steps that go along with the um, respective methods. And they look like this. This is just an example of the step-by-step -step things you do to prepare for a screening and then what you have to do to complete the screening. So take a look at these as a good reminder. Now, some of you had asked regarding Pure Tone, and we're gonna, we're gonna wrap up Pure Tone here in a minute and talk about OAEs. But before we do that, some of you asked about a refresher for how to document the results. And this here is a screening form that you can download on our, from our website um, that follows exactly the recommended screening um, protocol. And it walks you through it step by step. So we encourage you to use this because it does follow exactly the recommended process. The first step for any screening, as we said, is the visual inspection of the ear. And in most cases, the child will pass at this point and you'll move on. Then we condition the child, which is that second step that Terry went over. If the child can't be successfully conditioned to provide that behavioral response, then you'll either try again. And if you still can't condition the child, if you are able to do an OAE screening instead, that would be appropriate. And if you don't have OAE screening available or are unable to do OAE screening, then you would make a referral to the audiologist. But assuming that the child is successfully screened, the screening process then begins. And so we've got the screening, um, conditioning the child here. And Terry, I know you always have something to say when we get to this slide. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I always interject here. <laughs> um, we've received some questions about this conditioning process, um, as you mentioned, in preparation for today's webinar. Um, and really those have centered around how long that conditioning process should take. So let's, let's answer that. Um, children who are going to be successfully screened using the Pure Tone method, you should be able to um, screen them in about 10 to 15 minutes max. And that includes the conditioning step. So really that conditioning should not take more than five minutes, hopefully less. If you can't condition a child in that amount of time, then you probably should consider using your backup plan, which is either to do an OAE, hopefully right then while you have the child with you there, um, or you could also try um, your peer tone screening on another day if you have the flexibility to do that. But just remember, if you can't screen the child, you'll either need to do an OAE or refer the child to someone who will be able to successfully screen them, um, most likely a pediatric audiologist. So as we said earlier, just remember that some children who have hearing loss could be the very ones that are most difficult to condition to do the screening. So one way or another, we, we want to be sure that we get every child screened. So assuming that the child is successfully screened, the screening process then begins. And you can see on the form here, it provides a space to record the results for each ear. Since pure tone screening isn't automated, the form provides a reminder that for each ear, up to four presentations of the tone can be made at each frequency level, starting at 2,000, then 4,000, then 1,000, and that two responses are needed for the child to pass for a given tone. The screening begins by repeating the conditioning tone one more time and then proceeding. Okay. Now each child needs to have at least two successful responses out of no more than four attempts at each frequency level in order to have an overall ear pass.
Once that's recorded, the left ear is screened in the same way as the right ear, recording each presentation result as you go. If both ears meet the criteria for passing, then the child's screening process is considered complete. If one or more ears don't, however, meet the pass criteria, then, as you see here, a second screening of the previously non-passing ear is conducted in approximately two weeks. And then you would get those results. Now, Terry. What if a child does fine in responding at first, but then becomes distracted or you ob or you observe is is somehow no longer engaged in the screening and and say after the first couple of pitches, they just seem to have kind of decompensated. What do you do? Yeah, um, you you really you really want to go ahead and you can um, suspend that screening um, session for the time being. And then you could either, like we mentioned earlier, you can come back and have another screening session with them or go ahead and use your backup method, which is the OAE. Um, but again, you're going to want to be sure that we follow up and we get that child all the way through, even if we're unable to screen it ourselves and we need to refer them to a, an audiologist for a hearing evaluation. And so, Terry, you have to do the same thing, right? It, it, if there's a sudden increase in environmental noise, for example, that's outside of your control um, and you can't screen at that time, you have to come back at another time picking up where you left off. But you have yeah. to start with with conditioning again, right? Again, yes, that's right. If a child is not able to be conditioned again or to remain um, attentive, paying attention, then like I said, you should probably use the OE method or refer them to an audiologist. But there's a really um, important point here. Um, and I know we'll sound like a broken record, but again, that point is, is that sometimes children with hearing loss are the very ones who are most difficult to screen. So the last thing we want to do is to abandon that screening process on children who um, are unable to um, be conditioned and simply conclude that they can't be screened without doing something else. So whether that is screening with OE or making a referral to an audiologist, we need to follow up. So if... If we're still going through all of this kind of fast and you feel like you're not really getting it the way you need it, I would really suggest that you go back to our website to the training resources and and look at the Pure Tone training modules um, that go through this and pace through it at a slower pace where you can start and stop and really get this, this whole process nailed down. So let's say we do a successfully uh, a successful screening and we have one or both ears not passing at the second screening. We wanna make sure we indicate that on the form. And then the child is referred for a middle ear consultation from a healthcare provider. So they've not passed twice now over two separate screenings. They go to a healthcare provider and what's going to happen there, Terry? What? Why a healthcare provider? Well, because for you know, for any child who's referred for middle um, ear consultation from a, um, so we want to make sure that 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 middle ear system is clear and is processing that sound all the way through. So we want to send them to the healthcare provider for that um, evaluation. Um, and so for every child that's referred um, for a middle ear consultation from a healthcare provider, then we want to use the diagnostic follow-up form that you see here. And this is where you'll document the remaining steps in this child's screening and diagnostic process, starting with the results of the middle ear consultation. So since the child was referred to the healthcare provider to see if there might be any middle ear health related problems that may have prevented the child from passing the screening on either ear um, during your first two screening sessions, 
then you want to find out the results of that consultation and record them here. Then once the healthcare provider indicates that ears are healthy and clear, then you're going to want to rescreen the child's ears or the ears that have not pa yet passed and record those results. All children that are referred for middle ear evaluation must, and this is really important, once they've been cleared, they have to receive the rescreen on any ear that hadn't previously passed. Um, so if at this point there's still an ear that hasn't passed, then the child is referred for a complete audiological evaluation. And you'll want to support the family in completing this really important step and be sure to get those results and document them here. Um, and this form helps you to do that. You'll also want to collect additional supporting documentation um, from the audiological evaluation, especially if a permanent hearing loss is identified. And in most cases, this will include additional referrals for intervention services um, that you'll want to be aware of and you'll want to support the family in obtaining. And you know, these forms that we created, we did in collaboration with multiple um, early Head Start, Head Start, and Part C programs, trying to come up with the easiest to follow documentation strategy that would be complete and that would help you walk through each of the recommended steps. So you know, you might think you want to create your own form and you can try, but it's tricky to come up with a, a format that really does follow all of this. So before you do your own, give a good look at what we've done here because we've gotten a lot of input on how to how to make this work for folks. So let's pause for a moment here and see um, if we have any other, I don't I don't think there were any other hear tone related questions that we got right there, but jot them down if there's anything missing. Oh, you know, I know. Um, no, I think we're I think we're good with that. Um, so remember, you're going to find all of these resources on peer tone screening activities on kidshearing.org. So go there and have a look. All right. And that right there is where you'll find the training resources and so on. Um, remember also to look at the, the Pure Tone Audiometry Screening Skills Checklist, which is at, at the bottom. So that was Pure Tone. Now, let's shift gears and talk about OAE screening. Um, otoacoustic emission screening, as we've already said, is the recommended evidence-based practice for children birth to three years of age and is increasingly being used for children um, in older age brackets as well. Terry, some people want to have a review of how the OAE screening um, is done. Can you walk us through that? Yeah, so we're going to start at the very same place we did with pure tone screening. We're going to first take a thorough look at the outer part of the ear, again, to make sure there's no visible sign of infection or blockage. And then if the ear appears to be normal and healthy, then we're going to place a small probe. We use a small probe on which we put a, a disposable cover has been put on it or placed on it. We take that probe and we then insert it into the ear canal. And then we push the button to start the automated screening process. Now the probe sits independently. So that probe that sits independently in the ear delivers a low volume sound stimulus into the ear. Now the cochlea, or as you can see here on your screen, that inner snail shaped portion of the ear, a cochlea that's functioning normally, it will respond to this sound by sending the signal to the brain while also producing an acoustic emission. And this emission is analyzed by the screening unit. And in approximately 30 seconds or so, a result will appear. It'll appear either as a, um, as a pass or a refer. Now, right, every- Harry, Harry, wait a yeah. minute. Hold on. Because this is where a lot of our questions come in. You know, we go right past this moment where we are putting this probe in the ear and letting go. And, 
you know, there's all these people saying it doesn't stay in the ear or I get poor seal um, air messages. I, I don't think the probes are the right size. This is the difficult point in OAE screening that people are struggling with and that I think sometimes we can inadvertently make look too easy. So can you talk for a minute about some of the things about that we can do to get better at, more skillful at getting a probe in the ear for it to have a good seal, meaning it's not going to it's not going to have the outside sound interacting with what's going on in the inner ear and for it to stay put. It is really the, the pain point for people when we are um, doing OAE screening. Pain and for the screener, not the child. Exactly. For, for me, <laughs> it's the screener. This is the frustrating, I should call it the frustrating point, the point of frustration. Um, but there are, there are um, several things uh, to do. Um, the first is with uh, probe cover selection. So you see on the on the picture here, the black part is the probe, and you can see that um, beige colored foam tip that is on there. Um, that's one of my first recommendations is if you have the option for foam tips, use those. We find that those compressible foam tips, when they're inserted and expand, stay in the ear and are more stable than the other um, plastic tips. So that'd be my first recommendation is to use a foam tip if you have it. The second is the largest size probe tip that will fit in the ear, the better. Um, so uh, too small of a probe won't be stable in the ear. It'll let noise leak in and out and fall out. We like the, the largest one possible that will fit in that particular ear canal. The next thing though is, um, is a lot of practice. Um, the older children, of course, will tolerate probe placement better. So if you're newer to this, I would screen a lot of uh, um, screen adults in practice play, uh, placement. Then I would go to some of the elder, older children that will tolerate it well, and then move down to the younger children that are more apt to put a hand up and try to pull the probe out or wiggly or making um, making noise. So I in um, a key point to probe placement is um, we really don't, we really do not want to hold the probe in place. As a child moves, it can be um, pushed up against a, a ear canal wall. Um, they are made to be self-seating, and so it's it needs to fit in that ear and not be held in place. You're so more again, likely to have success if you let go than if you hold on. Actual, yes, yeah. So maybe to, to summarize, it's, um, um, it's probe fit is probably the most important thing to getting a successful test done. Um, second, use a foam tip if, you ha if it's possible. You have access to foam tips for your particular brand of equipment. I would recommend you use those. I would recommend you use the largest size tip that would appropriately fit in the child's ear. And then I would practice, um, practice, practice, practice on probe placement. Um, a lot of little skills that uh, experienced screeners start to take for granted, but it's how to approach the ear, how to approach the child, how to have that probe ready to slide right into the ear. So um, I don't want to under um, undersell experience. It's, it's really um, important. And you know, another thing that I think is a really important step in developing our skills is to spend time screening yourself to know what it should feel like so that it's really cut off all that sound where your ear has that clogged sort of feeling to it. You develop a sort of kinesthetic understanding of what you're trying to do on another person by doing it first on yourself. Really get it and knowing, oh, I have that really pretty tight in my ear it should be that tight in a child that I'm screening. It can't just loosely be in there. 
And so get to know it on yourself where you know you you can wiggle it around and you're not going to hurt yourself. You're not going to hurt the child either. Um, but you're you're more likely to be concerned about that. Um, so give a, give some practice to, to screening yourself as well. And so you develop more of that skill. Now, Terry, you talked a minute ago about how then we get these results of either a pass or a refer. Now, some of you are printing out results that have a lot more details on it than just the pass or refer. And some of you have asked, how do I interpret that? How do I know uh, what that all means? Some of you have even asked, um, how do I know what scores to look at to determine if a hearing loss is significant enough to warrant interventions? We need to make sure that everybody who's doing hearing screening really knows the role of screening. And screening is not to know anything more than pass or refer. The idea being refer is so that somebody else, a pediatric audiologist, and maybe the input of a healthcare provider can determine what the next steps need to be. And certainly they are the ones to determine whether there is a hearing loss or not, the significance of it, the type of early intervention that may be warranted, all of that. So um, you really don't need and shouldn't go into the weeds beyond knowing a pass or a refer result. Now, I'd like to do a quick poll question for those of you who are doing OAEs. Um, we're going to have a poll question come up on the screen. And first, I'd like you to just take a look at this um, table that you see on your screen and try to identify the device that you are using, mostly by appearance. Um, now, some of you are probably using devices that you don't see up here that are older models that are no longer being sold. But we're doing this question because some of you have been asking about well, what is everybody else using and, and what is working and what isn't? So to begin with, find your device and look at the column under, under which your device is found. For example, under column A, you'll see three different devices. Those three devices, though they have different names and they have a slightly different appearance, are basically the exact same device with a slightly different appearance. The same is true in column B. Those two devices are basically the same. And then the rest of them that you see there are individual devices. So find your device and tell us which one or ones you're using that you're the most that you've had some actual experience with and you can say multiple ones if there are multiples that you you notice up here now gunner am i going to be able to see the results well, this is gunner um i think so we'll see you once i close the poll okay Great. I can let you know what they are. If you so we'll give you about we'll give you about uh, ten seconds more to answer this question. Okay, can you close it and see what we get? Okay, mm. great. So. The most, the most common clearly are in that first A column, the, the, those three different devices you see there. Okay, that's really helpful to know. All right, now let's ask one more question using the same strategy. And do there we go. Thank you. And this is the question that a lot of you have been asking about because you're struggling with things like screening in, in noisy environments and 
getting too many refers or too many error messages. Gunnar, I don't see the second poll question, should I? There we go. Okay, now we want you to answer this question uh, about what equipment you would recommend, not that you're using, but that you would recommend for screening in a natural environment that is moderately noisy. And, you know, if you don't have a device that you feel good about in that way, don't answer this. Um, but tell us if you would make a recommendation that Overall, you, you've you had decent enough success that you would make a recommendation. And we'll give you about five more seconds to answer this question. All right, let's see what the, what our answers are here. Ah, interesting. So quite a few people are recommending those first three. Now, you're probably wondering, why don't you just tell us, William and Terry, as federally funded agencies, we're not allowed to make like material recommendations like that. Um, so this is our way to really get the perspective of those of you who are actually using these devices in those settings. So if you're having challenges with screening successfully in noisy environments, the question you should ask yourself, where is my device on this table? If it's in that A column, gee, some people are seem to be having relatively positive experiences with this, maybe I need to get some additional technical assistance from an audiologist or an additional screener, or maybe you need to have a one-on-one a, a -on -one conversation with one of us, or maybe reach out to some other people who are doing uh, using these devices. If you're in one of the other columns, it may suggest that that device is really harder to have success with under those screening conditions. And so that can inform for future purchases. Um, we always encourage people to um, try multiple purpose, uh, multiple brands of equipment before you purchase and to Give them a good test, not under just ideal circumstances, but under less than ideal circumstances to see if they're going to um, work for you in the way that you you need them to. So thank you, Gunnar. You can close that, close that down. Terry, did you have any other insights looking at those results? No, I don't think so. I um I think because this uh, particular piece of equipment, column A, is branded by three well-known brands, it makes sense um, there, and the um, availability of a phone tip for it now is is helpful. Yeah. So going back to our website, kidshearing.org, um, this is where you find not only the pure tone information but OAE related information. Again, a lot of it is the is the same. Big picture resources, finding an audiologist. We have equipment information on there. That table you just saw in another format is on there to look at these different brands of equipment. Um, so if if you need to get a reference from that, that's where you would go to look. Um, the training resources are there. So again, we encourage you to take a dive into the website to see what else is available there that can help ease some of these frustrations that you may be experiencing. So, um, and again, the screening skills checklist is one of those resources that we really encourage you to take a look at. Um, so, um, we also have one of our website um, 
uh, resources is this listen up video. Um, if you're having challenges in just getting children to cooperate, if there are children with special needs that you think need just a little bit more time to warm up to the idea of this, check out the video on there for under preparing children. And you'll see this short little listen up video, which is just meant for entertainment purposes primarily. Um, so again, our website And this is where you'll find the um, a to-do list. Um, the listen up video is at the bottom under preparing children. Letters to parents, letters to teachers, um, to get everybody on board knowing what it is you're doing. So, I'm, I'm thinking about our time here and I think what I'd like to do is open up the floor to see what kind of questions you have right now and see what else we can address. So um, can you, Gunnar, make the Q&A field available for us now. And if you all see that, there we go. Tell us if there are some questions that we haven't addressed that you would like some information about. Okay, um, can we put the link up uh, to your website again? It's kidshearing.org, and Gunnar will put it into the chat, kidshearing.org. Um, so let's see, the um, OAE screening form. We have a screening form, and it looks just like this. You see it on your screen there. And it walks through the entire screening protocol, um, just like the Pure Tone screening does as well. You um, do you start off, like Terry said, with the, the inspection of the outer ear and then progress from there. You do the OAE1 on each ear. And it progresses from there. So have a, and you can you can look at that on our website as well. And again, there's a more detailed description of the use of that form in the the modules that we have on online. Um, So where to find letters to parents? I think I'm going to go back to that website. So some of you, um, I think I went through that a little too quickly, huh? So on our website here, under screening resources, you'll see preparing screeners. It's a to-do list for yourselves. Preparing Parents is a handout for parents in English and Spanish. Preparing Teachers and Other Adult Assistants. Preparing Healthcare Providers. That's a letter you could send out to healthcare providers who may be getting referrals from your screening. And then Preparing Children. And that particular resource is found, whoops, sorry, on this page at the bottom under sharing letters and uh, screening resources, sharing results, um, preparing for screening. That's where those are. Okay. Um,
So on our website, if you, you're looking for autoacoustic emissions training information, you would see right here. This is the landing page for kidshearing.org. Under access training, you'll find OAE. And under each of these other bullets, you'll find information specific to OAE or pure tone screening. Um, can you talk more about screening in a moderately noisy environment and the reliability of the results? Terry? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, I love this question because that's one of the... Um, so let me talk about both methods though. First, um, with pure tone audiometry, we want as quiet of a environment as possible because we don't want any background noise interfering um, with um, the perception of those tones under, under headphones. Now we're also as equally, cons you know, we want as quiet of uh, environment as possible for OEEs, but one of the beauties of it is, is that we are able to screen in natural environments with a relatively, um, you know, mild or small amount of noise going on. Um, in fact, we have some exercises that you can do as you screen yourself and other adults on our website that will walk you through and show you how um, noise in the environment, noise that's generated from you or the child um, affects the, the screening. Um, but if you're in a moderately noisy environment and uh, you have OAEs, I'd go ahead and try to screen um, because if you get a good seal and you're able to measure that emission coming back out the way we talked about it, and it's um, able to uh, measure that and get a passing result, that's a reliable result and you can count on that. Okay. Next, oh, sorry, William. I was just going to that next one. Yeah, on, go, uh, go for it. Yeah. There's a, a question here that talks about only having access to pure tone audiometry with barriers to obtaining um, OAE equipment. How do we handle the we don't need it mentality? And so I'm, I'm thinking of that in two ways. One is, well, we don't need um, OAE or a backup method. And um, we, we really do need a backup method. Like we said, those children that are most difficult to screen are often the kids that actually have hearing loss or at risk for, um, for having hearing loss. And so um, we need to have a backup plan. And so that either includes OAE. In this case, you've got barriers to obtaining it. So then a... Um, a uh, referral relationship um, and consultation with a pediatric audiologist that can figure out and help you outline a uh, backup plan. Um, but second, if um, if the don't need it mentality is, is we don't need um, OAE, I think um, we can talk about that in two ways. The, the critical um, aspect of having a backup plan for children, and especially that 20 to 25% that we can't screen with peer tone audiometry. What are we going to do with those? And that's a high refer rate to, to send out. And then, um, William, we still have our mini grant um, templates yes. that available that um, perhaps could reduce the barrier to obtaining an OAE. We've had um, uh, programs that have been successful in writing um, these small grants because the equipment's fairly affordable. You can get a grant for um, under 5,000 for 5,000 or $4,000 to pay for the equipment. We've had Lions Clubs and Seroptimus. We've had some local family foundations. Um, we've had uh, some corporations that have been locally based in states that have uh, responded to that grant application and have helped programs get OAE equipment. Yeah, so Gunnar, could you post the link to that mini grant um, template that people could use? It's not plagiarism, by the way. You can just go ahead and cut and paste and use that as a grant proposal to any charity, um, charitable organization, or a potential funder to um, elicit funding for your equipment or supplies. Yeah. Um, somebody asked the question, are we able to purchase the Pure Tone equipment if we're not a licensed audiologist? Terry? 
Yeah, absolutely. You should be able to purchase that. Um, you know, uh, lots of uh, um, lay people um, learn to um, be good screeners. Uh, the only um, thing would be, as we mentioned earlier on in the in the webinar, is some states may have some certification or um, uh, kind of uh, guidelines on who can perform um, the various screening in their states. Uh, some states, though, have wonderful training for it um, as well, and so you could take advantage of the training on our website as well as the resources in the state. So, but you don't have to be licensed to purchase e actually either equipment. Um, Terry, um, another question. What would be your recommended amount of screening attempts once a child has failed or a referred code is given? Okay, yeah. So I like to think of the screening rather than, um, I like to think of it in sessions. So my first time with a child is a screening session. I might get a refer and I want to be sure that it's not kind of, um, I, I don't want to say my fault, but kind of factors that I can control. So I'm going to try again. I'm going to ensure that I got good probe fit, that I was trying to control for movement or um, internal, external noise that could affect this. So I'm going to try it again. And if I get a refer again, I may, again, just assess, is, is, it, um, is it something here that I can retry? So I may try two or three times. If my result is still a refer, then I'm going to follow our protocol and come back in two weeks and, and uh, rescreen um, that child. So I like to call it a session. I get a refer. If I have the ability and the, and the child's cooperative, I'm going to try two or three more times um, just to make sure that it isn't any other factor such as probe fit, noise, uh, movement, et cetera, in the environment. Um, let's see here. What are some tips, Terry, for choosing the best uh, and right probe cover size? Yeah, that's that's a really uh, key question. You know, when we first start the process, that very first step, when we're looking in the ear, um, we, and I probably neglected to say this then, but not only looking in that ear for um, blockage or drainage or some abnormality that would either say I could or could, could I should or shouldn't screen, but I'm also looking at the size of that little air canal. And so I want to take a good look there. And then I want to go to my probe covers and try to make a selection on that, how that, that ear looked. Now we talked about foam tips. Um, the nice thing with foam tips is um, you don't have such a wide selection to pick from. Usually you have an adult size foam tip, um, a pediatric foam tip, and maybe if you're lucky, you'll have a, one in the middle. We find that that pediatric foam tip will fit most of those little um, ear canals in that, say, zero to four or five-year-old group. Um, however, the other tip that I mentioned earlier is the largest size probe cover that will fit in that ear so that we get a nice snug um, fit. And then I would try different sizes in your own ears so that you get a feel for what a snug one should feel like and, and um, kind of look, did you pick a smaller one and you had to go up in sizes um, and just get some experience um, with that. Um, but I, I still, um, you know, over the years of experience, feel that those compressible foam tips um, as they expand in the ear canal, they're more stable. So the probe fits more snugly and tightly. It's more resistant to movement. And um, so I would um, try that first. All right. Um, what would you recommend for screening children with special needs and helping them to be more comfortable? Oh, well, that's such a great question. I think um, having a caregiver with whom the child is really comfortable with, help assist, um, have them hold the child. They can even keep their hands busy. They're the ones that I'll give my toy kit to and they get to present the toys and things to keep them busy. Well, I may just back right out of sight from in kind of behind um, and uh, try to get that screening. 
But I also may, um, if I have access to the child ahead of time, I may come in and meet them. I may massage their ears, um, talk to them, play. I might have the probe tip and run it up, bounce it like a bunny up their arm and into their ear without actually screening. But I may take time to familiarize them with not only myself so they're comfortable, but with the probe and the equipment. Um, and uh, I would um, also consult with the, the caregivers that are really familiar with that child because perhaps they know that nap time is here and the child is a sound sleeper. I may choose to go screen them while they're asleep. Um, so there's lots of little things there that, that uh, we could do. Now, often we have a child that comes in and we don't have the luxury of taking several days or, or whatever to help them become familiar with this. And that is then when I really like to have somebody that they're comfortable with um, um, help assist us. So Terry, this is a really good question. All of these are. This one happens to open up a whole can of worms. So living in a rural area, what do, we do not have access to pediatric audiologists and the pediatricians and audiologists follow up for us and often say that hearing is fine, yet the parents will report that the pediatrician does the bell whisper test and says they're fine. Then we're stuck between education versus medical with how to support families in going further without a referral from a doctor. How do we deal with this problem? You know, and this is like, I'll add, knowing that the bell and the whisper test is not a legitimate hearing screening, even though there may be professionals who continue to think it is. Yeah, this is such a, a challenge um, when there's a shortage or there's just lack of access to the, the right professionals. And when I say the right professionals, I, I mean not only those with the training and the expertise, but with um, the understanding of screening processes. And um, because screening, you know, we're, 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 it's like sorting things into buckets, but what we do when we screen is we're finding those children that, um, that are at risk, most at risk for having a hearing loss. And then we need that full evaluation and an assessment um, to ensure that hearing is fine. Um, I can really um, empathize with being stuck between being education versus medical with how, as you say, how to support parents and going further without a referral from their physician. We have some educational materials and we even have some letters that go from programs to um, medical professionals on the website. And well, are those easily accessible? If not, um, just know that they're, they're on our website. They're written in a way that helps um, medical providers understand the, um, yes. the steps to take, the process, but um, also can help educate them in, uh, in yes. the screen. On the screen right now, where you see um, where it says um, screening resources, prepare for screening and then sharing results. Both of those headings have resources for healthcare providers. We always recommend that when you make a referral to a healthcare provider, you provide some of the facts about what screening you're doing OAE or pure tone, and what it is you're looking for them to do. Usually that healthcare provider referral is to rule out a middle ear explanation for why the child hasn't passed yet. So we want the healthcare provider to do an assessment of whether the child might have a wax blockage or a middle ear condition that could explain the referring result. And then if it's addressed or they don't have that, then we need to rescreen the child again once there's no reason we can see that the child wouldn't pass. And if they still don't pass, that healthcare provider may be key in making a referral for an audiological evaluation. So you'll see in that referral letters sharing results that we've articulated the need 
for why we're going to the healthcare provider and what it is we're hoping they can provide. Yeah, it's really, um, you know, I, I appreciate this question in the sense that um, a lot of us, including our parents that we work with, we we assume there's being, a, you know, an actual hearing screening done at our provider's office, but they simply, they usually, the vast majority don't have um, hearing screening equipment. They don't do a hearing screening. They check the physical structures. They make sure that, um, you know, for the middle ear system, for example, they can assess for fluid or other middle ear um, health conditions. And perhaps they look at wax and remove it. But it's precisely because a hearing screening isn't being done in those settings is why programs like yours are so important. You're actually doing that piece of it. Um, and uh, But I know it's frustrating when that follow-up that's so important has barriers. And uh, um, I'm, I'm sorry that that's the case. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's so challenging at times. Um... Sometimes with children with tubes in their ears, it's hard with the OAE probe to find where it needs to be in order for the machine to do its reading. Any suggestions? Sometimes I need to hold it just right for it to start the reading. What do you make of that question, Terry? Yeah, you, you should be able to um, screen um, children with PE tubes, actually, just like you would any other child. Um, I don't do anything special with fitting the probe other than that just that probe fit is key for all, all children. Um, and uh, so um, if, if they refer with those tubes in their ears, then it's most likely probably due to middle ear disorder for which the tubes were, were placed. But we... Um, we it gives us also the opportunity then to make that referral and, and they can ensure that either tubes are functioning working or if there is still some middle ear health issues um, that that need to be addressed um, but uh, we should be able to place the probe just like we would for for any other child and have it function um, and get that refer or pass or refer just knowing in in the refer cases that there's probably a higher probability that it's middle ear related. So this next question comes out of a concern we all share, and that has to do with the costs of equipment and of these disposable for OAE, the disposable probe covers. Are there any places we can purchase less expensive ear tips for the Welsh Allen OAE screener um, the cheapest is nearly a dollar per ear tip on Medline. Um, so there's two pieces to this question, right, Terry? The first is a cautionary one that you have to purchase the ear tips that go with your particular screener. You might see them for another and think, oh, I could, if I had that screener, they're cheaper, I'll buy those. You can't interchange them. Um, you'll get faulty results if you do that. So you really do not ever do that. As far as finding cheaper sources, Terry, what what advice do you have? Yeah, thank you. So making sure that they are probe covers that are manufactured for your machine. But then second, I you I would do some shopping um, because there there is some variability um, there. So there's. Um, um, I would, you could look at E3 diagnostics, you could look at school health, um, you could look at booth medical, but there, there's, um, you know, various vendors that will sell the supplies for the, the, this equipment. I will say that that column A that you, um, that it looked like the majority of you were all using has probe covers that are sold by some of these other vendors for that specific machine. So there's probably more pricing opportunity to look at across those and probably less opportunity as you go further to the right of the chart that William um, showed you. But it is worth shopping um, for um, a, a, across vendors that support um, autoacoustic emission screening equipment. 
We are at the bottom of the hour, which means we have been on for 90 minutes now. And I know many of you have other places to go and be. Um, we hope this has been helpful. Um, if we can be of further assistance to you, um, feel free to um, message us through our website. Also note that next week on Tuesday, February 27th, we have an introductory webinar in which we'll be talking about a lot of these same things, but more from a beginning perspective. Um, you're welcome to join us there if you'd like to continue a, a dialogue um, and encourage people that you need, uh, who need to know more about this, to attend this webinar. Um, we're really happy that we're able to provide these services um, for you. We're no longer really funded to um, provide training or technical assistance in the way we just have done. But because we've seen this ongoing need, we are just doing this because we want you all to have success and to do whatever we can to help minimize some of the frustrations that go along with trying to implement evidence-based practice. Um, just because it's evidence-based doesn't mean that it's easy. And um, so if we can if we can provide any other support, um, please let us know. Also know that if you, if you go to um, kidshearing.org and look at the training options, you'll find ways to get more information about how to get comprehensive training in OAE and pure tone screening. Gunnar? This is Terry. Oh, Can I yeah. interrupt really quick? Yeah. Um, I just did a price check on the last uh, question and School Health sells the ones for the column A equipment, a hundred count for $36.99. Um, so School Health could be a resource for those of you that have some of that equipment. Oh yeah, that's a, that's a really good price. Um, okay, that's great. Before you all run off, in the in the chat box, there is a link there to give a quick evaluation um, to today's webinar and that will generate a certificate of attendance. So if you want to document that you were with us today, um, go and, and complete that. And um, thank you, everybody. Thank you to our... our Interpreter and interpreters and captioner. Thank you, Gunnar, for your background technical support. And Terry, of course, as always, thank you for being so helpful. We hope we'll see some of your colleagues next week, February 27th, um, in this same place. Remember, this was recorded. <laughs>